Radical, episode 201. Welcome to Radical, ladies and gents. I'm your host, Shane Hazel. Thank you guys for being here. Yes, three shows in one week. Yeah, I've been uh, obviously recovering, um, still recovering. And if it sounds a little different, it's because I couldn't stand being in, uh, in that bed doing the show the way it sounded. I uh, thought I'd come up here and try my hand at at least a short show uh, to get you guys a third show and uh, a better sounding show. Like, I, I don't know. I know you guys, um, you guys, you guys know how I am, man. Like I am somewhat of a, a very stubborn, um, I don't know, perfectionist in some ways. Like th- this is, this is one of those things that I absolutely love doing and I love doing it because I like doing it the right way. And I, 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 I find it very interesting, you know, to put together uh, produce, edit, and all these kind of things. Uh, podcasts, like I, I'm, I'm just it's one of my favorite things in the world to do. So, um, anyway, uh, today we've got a, a bunch going on, and I thought, man, you got to get in front of a real goddamn mic and do this the right way. Um, big thing in the news today, obviously, is the I don't know the the acceptance by all the high and mighty people at the New York times of the Biden laptop like holy shit I, I mean I, I'm 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 kind of shocked that it's happened I'm, I'm kind of shocked that this hasn't gone away uh, with a news media that is on 10 24 7 365 for years uh, whether it was you know the I mean I I remember this, like, I, I don't remember having a lot of downtime since about 2001. I just think the media has been, you know, doing really, really copious amounts of cocaine from since 2001 to now. Like, it is absolutely insane the level these guys run at all the time. Um, maybe no accident that we're talking about Hunter Biden in this laptop today, not to mention what surrounded this entire thing. Why is this even a fucking story for God's sakes? Um, I did pull up a piece uh, to, to kind of talk about this from the New York post. If you guys remember back in uh, 2019 going into 2020, I guess um, the, the entire idea that deplatforming was happening to people uh, was, you know, it was a real thing. People were shadow banned, getting deplatformed. And one of the things they were getting deplatformed for was talking about Hunter Biden. You know, during campaign season, Hunter Biden was absolutely off limits. The pictures were emerging from this laptop um, towards the end of um, the, in, 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 at the end of the election that I think probably had the, the propagandists reacted to it like they react to any story on the Republican side. Uh, Some, a lot of Republican sides. If this is Donald Trump's, you know, if this was Donald Trump Jr.'s laptop, like we'd still be hearing about it. But at at any rate, you know, they, uh, those guys over at the New York Post, they ran a story about it and Twitter took it down. Twitter was like, no, you're not, you're not going to talk about this right now. Right. And I, I think that's probably the, the bigger story. Um, the, the opinion piece that I have is uh, by a guy named Kyle Smith. It says, how Dem officials, the media, and big tech work in concert to bury the Hunter Biden story. So this is more the side of the, the story um, of, you know, like, listen, Hunter Biden, I know he's wrapped up in some really, really shady shit with Ukraine and uh, his dad and energy companies and things like that. Like I'm, this is, this is all a shit show. Like he, there's, there's no doubt in my mind, like this whole escalation in Ukraine is, it's, it's something around, you know, B- the Bidens around Pelosi, around Mitt Romney. I mean, tons of money laundering going on over there. I mean, Ukraine was really kind of a, just a powder keg. It was a shit show. And it has been that way, uh, for, for a while, you know, and you look at people who are trying to, uh, rattle control, uh, you know, Vladimir Putin and really push Western banking into Russia. You kind of see like, man, this is, this is, this is the devil's playground, right? This is alphabet soups from all over the world. 
uh, you know, MI6, this is Mossad, this is Kremlin, it's CIA, DE, or well, maybe not, maybe DEA is not there, but I'd be shocked. FBI, CIA, NSA, the the guys from, I'm sure some of the FBI are there. Like this is this is a big, big breeding ground for corruption, huge. Um, but this, the story that broke, um, right before, and you know, it's just, it really started gaining escalation right before the election was buried. And I think it brings up a lot of points, which will hit what well, we're talking about, uh, this article, but it's to see this and to see where the world is and who's still listening to mainstream media uh, who have any faith, like, you know, the, the, the fact that there's not more of a, you know, a, a come to Jesus moment with the people who are on social media and the social media platforms, I think is, you know, I don't know, it's kind of weird. Uh, but at the same time, I do see this unity of people coming together like there's a lot of things going on right now where people are going yeah man the fact that you guys in tech and propaganda and politics and banks are censoring people and you're working in concert together boy it is it's bad for you that people are starting to recognize that to wake up and see it so anyway the 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 article is by Kyle Smith over at the New York Post. It starts off, this was written on uh, March 18th. Oh, and happy birthday, Birdie. Um, I know you're out there, and uh, none of you guys know who Birdie is except for Birdie. Uh, maybe some of you do, but uh, love you, buddy. Uh, hope you're good and uh, special. Uh, enjoying your, your special little uh, birthday here. So anyway, um, let's get into it. Everlast, everlasting, undying, soul-rendering shame be upon you, Facebook and Twitter and Politico and all the others who covered up, denied, and suppressed this newspaper's true and accurate reporting about Hunter Biden's laptop in 2020. You should be hurling yourselves at the feet of the American people begging for forgiveness. You should be renting billboards saying, we lied. But most importantly, you should be hauled before Congress to answer humiliating questions. I'm going to pause. Um, the fact that you're going to haul, you know, these people in front of their people, and nothing's going to happen. Like that's Kyle. I I love, and I trust me, I do this kind of shit too. Like I get caught up in old narratives and all that kind of stuff. And no, these people should be in prison. Like these people should be absolutely imprisoned for lying like literally lying to the american people i this is i mean to 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 be a quote unquote news outlet of any sort to think that i mean i don't know maybe maybe we're getting into definitions now but i'm not going to say i'm not going to mince words like these fucking people i think they're goddamn criminals of the highest sort that are running shade for the worst people on earth that's that's how i feel should they be hauled into a prison i think they should i I don't think you get to do this kind of stuff to the the masses and get away with it i don't am i calling for uh the state to have them you know strung up and and have the, the power of you know taking their lives i'm not but i swear to god throwing these monsters in cages so that they can never do this kind of shit again to people like, yeah, that's, that's probably pretty tame compared to what a lot of people want to do. The article goes on these and other information purveyors owe us, not just this paper, but this country restitution for what now looks like the most egregious and willful fake news scam of our time. The paper scoops on Hunter Biden's laptop in 2020 were labeled Russian misinformation by Politico, a hoax by Stephen Brill of fact check site NewsGuard, discredited by many, many red flags at NPR, and a hack and leak operation that had to be throttled by Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg. And then it's got some pictures of Hunter Biden Jr., and his his dad flying on what looks like a cargo plane somewhere. Um, 
It says, now that the New York Times finally admits that the Hunter Biden laptop story is true, it's time for everyone involved in suppressing in suppressing it to be held to account. I don't think that's ever going to happen. Then it's got, um, you know, the New York Post. Uh, it's a, I guess it's dated October 15th of 2020. Uh, it's got, you know, Junior and, and, and Hunter, or I should say Junior and Senior there, uh, standing beside each other, smiling like a bunch of crackheads. Uh, saying censored Facebook and Twitter block posts post expose on Hunter Biden's files. And then you've got some more pictures of Hunter Biden doing some really creepy, uh, shady white trash shit that, uh, that Hunter Biden is all into. So anyway, it, it keeps on going. Uh, it was the infamously snuff. It was infamous. Excuse me. It was infamously snuffed out on Twitter, as was the post Twitter account, because of a policy about hacked materials that only seemed to apply to this one case. Twitter didn't bar the New York Times stories about Donald Trump's tax returns, which could have come from hacked materials for all we know, and almost certainly were the product of a criminal act leaking tax returns is against the law, but the Times never even told us. How, to, how it got the returns. So we don't know. Um, yeah, you know, obviously double standards are all the rage uh, for propaganda. It's, just, it's how it has to be. Aren't you silly? Come on, Kyle. The Post acted with transparency in explaining to readers how it got, it, how it got the laptop from hell. Moreover, nobody on Team Biden denied the Post report because they knew or suspected it was true. Every news outlet in the country should be fronted had, should have fronted the story at that point. Biden's team refuses to deny Hunter Biden's laptop story. A few months later, Hunter himself said the laptop certainly could be his, and the media shrugged instead of apologizing. Well, you know, uh, crackheads leaving laptops around. Go figure. I mean, I guess being a being a rich enough crackhead to be such a daddy's boy and have enough you know money to leave you know that kind of shit around. I guess. Oh man, doesn't pay, does it? There, maybe, maybe I don't know. At least the the court of public opinions catching up with these idiots. Uh, it's got some more. It's got the New York Post. After cries of Russian disinformation, a media blackout, and a Twitter ban, Hunter admits that the laptop certainly could be his. And it's got you know their picture again together, the long con, um, and then it's got a picture of the uh, the Mac shop where they uh, they. I guess grabbed this thing and said, Hey, you know, we've got something here that's uh, kind of important. So anyway, the article keeps going even in the presidential debate where the matter came up, Joe Biden's comments were not a denial, but simply a deflection. And everybody who reported that he denied the laptop story was guilty of propagating fake news all over again. What he actually said was there are 50 former national intelligence folks who said that what he's accusing me of is a Russian plant. Five former heads of the CIA, both parties say what he's saying is a bunch of garbage. Nobody believes it except his good friend, Rudy Giuliani. He said that on the debate stage. I, I don't know if you guys have seen it. I don't know. You know, I have no idea, but I remember that as plain as day. I remember when this whole thing came up in the debates and he went on this rambling wreck of like, you know, CIA and 50 former intelligence people, whatever it was. And it was just this mumbling bullshit, um, on, on stage in front of everybody and nobody, like nobody said anything, you know, Trump obviously cooked his head to the side, put his lip out and did what Trump does. But, um, Nobody reported it. Nobody talked about it. They just buried it. Article goes, Joe, who later said, yes, yes, yes. When a reporter asked him if he believed the laptop was Russian disinformation, the question allowed him all the wiggle room in the world. Pointedly, wasn't denying that the laptop belonged to Hunter and wasn't denying that the material on it was genuine. He was simply referring to the now infamous Politico whitewash on October 19th of 2020 which was fake news about fake news. The headline, Hunter Biden's story is Russian disinformation. Dozens of former intelligence officials say didn't even accurately relate what was in the story. Those officials simply said 
they were suspicious about Russian involvement, admitted they had no evidence for this, and pointed out this was buried in the 10th paragraph of the political story. We want to emphasize that we do not know if the emails are genuine or not. They didn't know. They have no idea, is the quote, basically. In other words, the notorious liar James Clapper, as far as I can tell, every signatory who made his opinion known about the election was a Biden supporter. We're simply peeing in the dark. Their ranked speculation was unworthy of being published. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, I mean, what a... What a time to just sit there and be like, no, man, like all these pictures of Hunter with these girls or smoking crack pipes. I mean, like literally talking to people, smoking crack, laying in bathtubs with, you know, like just the the butt of a cigarette hanging out of his mouth, covering up his nipples, like standing around, you know, naked with sunglasses with red scarves on. This guy is... This is a huge, huge story. And, I mean, people are sitting, you know, like not only sitting back, it's like they're scared. And it's like all of them have been threatened with a mass communique out there. And they're like, hey, man, if you talk about this, we're going to send the Clintons after you. I'm just saying that's what it sounds like to me. I know, conspiracy. Oh, oh no, conspiracy. Like, and, and give it another six months. Right. Maybe that'll pop up. I'm, I'm telling you right now, I don't think, you know, tangent here. I think what Putin might have cooking a lot of time right now is a bunch of Biden stuff. I think it's a bunch of Clinton stuff. I think it's a bunch of DOD shit. Like I think when this is all wrapped up, I think there's going to be, you know, the equivalent of WikiLeaks times, a factor of 10 that comes out. I really do. And I hope it does. Like I, I there's no damn good governments. The, the faster they can all be discredited as megalomaniac genocidal monsters, the better. Back to the article. Yet Politico's fake headline on this piece of partisan fan fiction gave the media and its Democratic Party enforcers all the cover they needed to treat the whole story like it was a ruse planted by Vladimir Putin. Say geniuses, say geniuses, if Putin had simply fabricated the whole thing, don't you think Hunter Biden would have said, that's not my stuff? And, would have, and wouldn't Putin have planted material that would have nuked Joe Biden's presidential aspirations rather than merely raising the question about his son's dealings? All Jen Psaki had to do was retweet Politico's bull spit headline, who reads Beyond Headlines. Oh, God, there's another picture of him naked. Jesus. I mean, this guy is, he's, he's nuts. The last paragraph, the Times and other major papers simply ignored the substance of the Post scoop, and now their readers know. Or, rather, have just been re, re, re reminded that their Democratic Party cheerleaders, who even allow the presidential candidates to dictate details of how they get covered. The next time they quote unquote fact checked, the next time they cry woof, who will believe them? Uh, It's a great article. Uh, Kyle is, I guess, on all the social medias, Kyle Smith. I will link it in the show notes. But um, yeah, this is, I mean, this has got to be one of those nails for a lot of people in the fucking coffin. Like this has got to be one of those stories that turns a lot of people from liberal, Democrat, progressive, whatever the fuck they are, man. Like to see everything that's going on in the world. I mean, the the deplatforming, the silencing, the othering, the the erasing of people and and total organizations by the no kidding, and I mean it's a perfect word for it, the concert of alphabet soups and bureaucrats and the government and the bankers and the technocrats. Not to mention, it's like, it's not that you just can't trust the media. These motherfuckers are the enemy. Like, these are the enemy of the people, the good, peaceful people of this country. These people are the ones you should be looking at with with skepticism 
and, and, and I re every time they open their mouth, put something in print, take a picture of something, everything that they do, you should be looking at skeptically. And that's, I mean, I'll, this is a, a hard lesson for a lot of people to learn, especially people who are older that kind of grew up with, you know, the, you know, three channels on a TV or, you know, Fox news or any of that kind of stuff. Like people get addicted to this shit. And I'm, I'm not kidding. Like people start to trust people in organizations that have lots of money with lots of power one way or another. And they're like, yeah, no, I kind of believe what's coming out of this guy's mouth. I kind of believe what's coming out of this guy's mouth. I, I you know, there's, <sighs> that's got to stop. You have to look at everything that everybody in network says or does with a, <laughs> as if they have a motive they, and they do. Most of them have a motive. I mean, take a, a look at, you know, Ukraine, the, the, their motive for the MIC is make money, right? The motive for the people in DC stay in office by taking money from the MIC. The people that cover things like war, you know, the, the really, really big news organizations that send people over. Those people love war. They depend on war. They need war for ratings. Like those are their best ratings. That's where they get all of their money. Elections, war, blood, death, destruction, fear. The, the more you can ramp up, you know, the, the more there is. At some point, people just go, oh, fuck this stuff. I'm done. I'm tuning out. I hope this is that moment. I hope this is that moment for a lot of people out there that are, are just sick of it. They'd rather leave it. Maybe not deal with it at all. But chances are they're going to they're gonna start looking for other things. I mean, that's what I did. I guarantee you that's what a lot of you did out there when it came to uh, divorcing yourself from the system. You know, most of you guys didn't start out as uh, these, you know, anarchists that leave, believe in free money like Bitcoin. You know, I should say money free of banks and government. Right? You guys are pushing towards the voluntary side of this spectrum. Voluntary is such a better word than anarchy. Anarchy has been stigmatized. <laughs> the voluntary side versus the coerced and forced, the tyrannical side. And you guys are, you guys are so far ahead of the game and thank you guys for sharing all this kind of stuff. And, and thanks for tuning in. If you're new, like this is, this is a big deal. So let's, um, let's, let's put away the Joe Biden story. You know, um, Let's, let's talk about kind of some of the, the aspects just for a second. These fact checkers over the past two years have gone out of their way to dismantle and disrupt and deplatform people. All for speaking the truth. All of it. I'm, I guarantee, obviously, most of it's been done in conjunction with the people from the banks, people from the government, uh, and the, and the propagandists in the media. Like, I think they're all doing this shit together, which makes them every fucking one of them. It makes them the goddamn enemy of the state. This isn't a mistake. This is a effort. This is action that has been taken deliberately and it's been taken to control you, to deprive you of your rights, to deprive you of your freedom, to deprive you of movement. This is what they want. This is what they have in store for all of us. All of us. I think it is absolutely disgusting. I think these people are some of the, the biggest criminals on earth right now. Literally. And when you look at what happens because of these people, People die, not by onesie twosies, by tens, if not hundreds of thousands. COVID, war, you name it. The breakdown in, you know, in economies, in supply chain, starvation, imprisonment. This is 
This is who these people want in control. They want the fucking murderers and the thieves in control of everything that you do. That's why they're going to be pushing CBDC soon. <sighs> Central banking dollars, guys. Like total digital, no more cash, no more, no more unknown transactions with your fellow man as far as they're concerned. That is what's going on with people like Elizabeth Warren today. And if you missed this, this was this was one of those pieces where I was just like, oh my God, man, listening to this lady. I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little bit more here because I think this one was important. Um and my back is just not holding up awesome. Uh so I'm gonna probably cut this short. But Elizabeth Warren was, you know, questioning uh Johnny Levin today. Johnny Levin uh, is the co-founder of the uh, chain analysis, and it's you know talking about bringing transparency to the future of money and recovering. He's a recovering economist and uh, a Bitcoin bounty hunter. Uh, I guess that's probably he you know goes out there and uh, finds people who have stolen Bitcoin for people. But at any rate, I want you to hear. Um, how Elizabeth Warren addresses this. Uh, she asked a question. Obviously, she has a preloaded uh, question uh, for, for Johnny. And she doesn't like Johnny's answer a whole lot, but listen to this. Mr. Levin, let's consider one of Putin's cronies who already has a billion or so in crypto that he wants to hide from the governments that are enforcing sanctions on oligarchs. Now, can this oligarch make it harder to trace his money if he hops from one blockchain to another, if he deposits those tokens into a couple of wallets that don't require him to provide identifying information, and if he uses a mixing service that launders his money with other people's money? Thank you, Senator. So the, um, the scenario that you, you describe um, where an oligarch has a billion dollars to be able to launder requires significant amounts of liquidity to be able to obfuscate that amount of money through the use of cryptocurrency. In fact, you know, many times we've been able to identify... No, I'm sorry, let me just remind you of what my question was again. What I'm asking is about the tools... All right, so she doesn't like his answer so far. He's saying, "Hey, uh, actually, what your what your fears are, um, I don't actually recognize him. Uh, he, like he he's an expert in this field in terms of transactions on the blockchain. And for some of you guys that are out there that don't know about like services like CoinJoin uh, that will take your coins and you know kind of mix them." and other coins and then take those coins and push out the amount that you put in into a cold wallet that nobody knows who you are. That's what she's asking about, right? Like, is there a chance for anonymity? Sure. There's still chances for anonymity. It's not that the chain for Bitcoin won't record what's going on in terms of every transaction. It's just that she wants to know, how this happens and if it is another path that takes power out of the hands of the banks and the government for that for that tracing and this this gets very contentious very quickly that are available now he may have to break it up into multiple pieces of who knows 100 million dollars at a crack but the question I'm asking is, does hopping from one blockchain to another, does depositing tokens in a couple of wallets that don't require them to provide identifying information, and does using a mixing service all make it easier for him to hide his money? So, Senator, the answer to that question is no, because the chain hopping that occurs, you need uh, to actually provide the tokens, which in a transparent way that allows you to move across blockchains, We've actually got software that so allows you to... So you don't think chain hopping makes it any easier I, to hide your money? How about depositing tokens in wallets that don't require identifying information? You can always split the money up into wallets that don't require... And that would help but, hide the but, money. And how about using a but mixing that does, service? But that, that doesn't remove the record of where the money actually sits. But the question so I'm asking is, does it make it harder to track the money? No, so it doesn't make it harder to and, track the money and because... Using a 
and he is very smart in this. It does not make it harder to track money. It makes it harder for government to track people. Very different things, right? Wallets are wallets. Ledgers are ledgers. But if it is, let's just say, for the sake of argument, Let's say it's a bad person who's doing these things. And we know bad people don't transact in dollars or launder money in dollars or anything like that ever, right? Like they don't ever break them up and send them to different banks around the world, whether it's in Switzerland or, you know, the Canary Islands or down in the um, the Caribbean in terms of like taking the money that would be taxable here in the United States and then passing it through a whole bunch of other places, banks, uh, securities, investments, you know, n- nobody, nobody does that in dollars. I hope most of you can sense my sarcasm. Elizabeth is, is mad that you're not getting like the government is being, I guess, fronted with another organization, especially Bitcoin, that is going to change the dynamic of this. They have a monopoly on it right now. The the banks and the government have a monopoly of force on the means right now. And the contention, especially with Bitcoin, She's not going to come out and say it because I'm pretty sure her banker friends don't want her talking about Bitcoin specifically because they know the more that they talk about it as the threat, then more people are going to move to it specifically. She's just pissed off. She's just pissed off that now there's another player in town that doesn't give a rat's ass because it's a code. It doesn't care. If you are a government official, it doesn't care if you're a banker, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're doing a show out of North Georgia on the side of a mountain. That's what she's mad about. And the answer and the tact that Johnny uh, Levin has given here, man, that's, that's awesome. There the mixing is, service you're telling me doesn't make it harder to launder money? The, the daily liquidity value of mixing services globally is about $30 million. So you and might so have therefore to do it would, day by would, day? And we have done extensive work in tracking large sums of money through mixers that have led to the arrests of well, people and the disruption of their activity. You know, I'm, I'm actually a little surprised by your answer since you charge a lot of money to untangle and track assets through the system and the system keeps developing more ways to obscure that money and that's part of what you advertise obscured money from a person you know that has been okay with uh you know printing eight trillion dollars in the last couple of years uh and putting it into all the shady shit that it goes into in our government like she oh it's so fucking see-through when you see it it is, it's beyond see-through. She doesn't give a shit about any of this kind of stuff. What she really cares about is the threat to her monopoly on force and violence. Like that, that's it. And here's the other thing is like, if you're, if you're new to Bitcoin and all that kind of stuff and what she's talking about, like, yes, you know, like a lot of what we're talking about at the smaller level, that's what she's mostly concerned about, right? Like, if you're talking about small time, mostly peaceful people that are using this stuff for transactions that are outside of the law, and we all know how moral the laws have been as of recent, especially, we know that they want to be able to attract the smaller people. They want force, they want to be able to use force and coercion against Joe Schmo and Jane next door. And what we're talking about in terms of people with hundreds of millions of dollars, like you're still going to be able to see those transactions on a blockchain somewhere. You're going to still be able to see those on a ledger. I guess what gets, you know, really confusing for her is I mean, there's all these different, you know, anonymous accounts out there that are just making transactions that we can't track. That we have no idea what they're doing, you know, who they are what they're selling, what they're buying, what they're trading for, whether it's goods or services, commodity, like this, this, this throws a, throws a giant wrench in a lot of different people's 
um, you know, plans for control. And, you know, if she was, I think if she was actually really educated on this, I don't know. She's a pretty despicable woman. Uh, maybe, maybe she wouldn't be going down this path. I have, I have no idea. All right. We got through the Elizabeth Warren story. Like I, I, I'm not okay. I mean, this lady flies around in goddamn private jets. She is taking money from, um, you know, huge, huge packs and God knows where most of that kind of stuff comes from. Right. Like, uh, it's interesting article, uh, coming out of Bitcoin on this, uh, very thing, right. The, the FUD on the illicit activity with Bitcoin, right? Like basically that's, that's one of the things that, uh, you know, people talk about it. They, they talk about all this different stuff in terms of, you know, decrying cryptocurrency and I'm just going to say Bitcoin. Um, and most of the stuff is a reflection, a projection of what fiat is in the first place. Uh, can we go through this article? Yeah, we we'll probably go through this article. I'll see if I'll, I'll, I'll toughen up for you guys. Uh, this is an article by uh, Gaijus Leidis, uh, written March 16th. Uh, it's U.S. Treasury confirms we can remove illicit activity from Bitcoin FUD dice. Uh, is there FUD dice out there? Basically, uh, yeah, there's, there's FUD dice and you can click it uh, in this article, which I will also link. Uh, the FUD dice is uh, things like, uh, you know, high fees, energy waste, small blocks, um, you know, how often, you know, blocks can, you know, be mined, uh, no turnings, uh, toxic fans, I mean, you you name it, um, disincentivizes, you know, economic activity. Uh, it's just, it's all these things that we, it, the Bitcoin community in general have known about for a long time that have written about for a long time, uh, have, uh, you know, kind of prepared for, you know, it's, it's like, we know what you're going to come with. We know you're going to try to derail Bitcoin as many times as you can. So at any rate, um, the FUD has actually been put to bed a little bit by the Treasury. Uh, this this article, uh, with the U.S. Treasury recently indicating that Bitcoin and altcoins aren't used for significant and illicit activity, it's time to change the narrative. It's time to take illicit activity off the FUD dice. Earlier this month, the U.S. Department of the Treasury published reports that indicated that the use of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies for illicit activity is far outstripped by the use of traditional assets, fiat currency in other words. Critics can no longer credibly present the specter of illicit activity to beat back Bitcoin. Now the foremost experts in the world say it is not a major threat. The Treasury Department published three reports that identified key concerns for money laundering, terrorist financing, and weapons proliferation proliferation financing. Here's what each said about the use of cryptocurrencies. The use of virtual assets for money laundering remains far below that of fiat currency and more traditional methods. The 2022 National Money Laundering Risk Assessment on page 41. Terrorists use use of virtual assets appears to remain limited when compared to other financial products and services. The 2022 National Terrorist Financing Risk Assessment, page 23. There is no evidence that the proliferation network has used a virtual asset to procure a specific proliferation-sensitive good or technology. The 2022 National Proliferation Financing Risk Assessment, page 29. Case closed. Staff of the U.S. Treasury, the authors of the report, are most knowledgeable and best equipped investigators and enforcers against illicit financing in the world. Moreover, the reports were viewed by other U.S. government partners, including the Departments of Justice, the Department of Homeland Security, and the FBI. There could not be a more authoritative source to convey these findings. Now, institutions aside is basically, he's saying that now even the institutions in the treasury are saying this isn't a problem. Illicit activity on the blockchain is not a problem. Back to the article. Of course, the treasury's reports confirm what industry participants have demonstrated for years. 
the most recent edition of the Crypto Crime Trends reports published by Blockchain Analysis. Firm Chain Analysis, for instance, found that just 0.15% of the cryptocurrency transactions volumes in 2021 involved illicit addresses. The recent ad- arrest of the alleged Bitfinex hackers, uh, yeah, Bitfinex act, act hackers, and the seizure of nearly 100,000 Bitcoin almost demonstrates that the moving large sums of money on a public network that can be monitored from a Raspberry Pi isn't as easy as, well, Pi. But the reports also confirm that we know from common experience that we use Bitcoin far, far, far more frequently for strong wealth and sending money for storing wealth and for sending money to family members and reducing emissions and making micropayments and fleeing the freaking Taliban than for illicit finance. After the publication of these reports, if you are a journalist or a policymaker or a pundit or even an anon on Twitter, it is now irresponsible and flat out wrong to say that crypto is a major vector for money laundering or terrorist financing. The top experts in the world disagree. I'm going to leave it at that. Um, anyway, I thought this is uh, I thought this was really pretty interesting. Now that we have the U.S. Treasury coming out and saying, "Yeah, this is really not a threat." Uh, we knew it all along in this community. Um, when you have a, a public ledger and you can sit back and point to it, you know, obviously with two parties that are consenting, if whatever goes under, and they go, "Yeah, look at all these transactions that I made," like not a great place uh, to be if you're doing illicit things. And really, I think illicit should probably just be defined more or less as hurting people and taking their stuff for the most part. That's harm. Hurting people and taking their stuff. We we all know what it is. We all know how it goes. Um, I think that's probably about all my back has in store for you guys today. Um, I appreciate you guys tuning in. I appreciate your patience again. Uh, thank you guys for being just the, the greatest audience in Liberty. I mean, you guys are fantastic. I mean, the, the unity that this crowd is putting together where we don't fall into the bullshit traps of, you know, politics in, in whatever circles they are like, this is, this is one of the coolest, most encouraging crowds out there. And, um, I appreciate the kind words from a lot of you guys too, in terms of healing. And thank you for doing this, even when uh, you're you're hurting. And you know, this is yeah, I I got patrons, man. Like you guys are out there, and I love you to death for uh, believing in me, for you know, going out there and, and becoming a a patron of the show. Like it, it means a lot. And you know, we don't try to get crazy or too fancy on the show. Um, a lot of stuff is going to change, hopefully, here over the summer. And, you know, with this campaign for governor, like you guys, we're just getting started. Like I got to, I got to heal up and we got to get this, uh, we got to get really, really pushing, especially, uh, out into places in Georgia. And I'm looking forward to meeting a lot of you guys on the campaign trail this time around, especially if, uh, we can get a little bit of gas relief, but at any rate, uh, I will see you guys here probably early next week. I may not, I may, I don't know. We'll see if I have another show in me for Saturday or Sunday to get, completely caught up, but I definitely owe you guys at least one extra show, uh, either this week or next week. And I'll make sure that that gets done until then. I do hope you have a great Friday night and a wonderful weekend, whatever you're doing until then. I love you. I need you. Peace. Um, don't hurt people and don't take their stuff.